We are lucky today. We have with us a friend of mine, uh, someone who I met through a group that I'm involved in, the MG100, and it has been such a pleasure to get to know her. Erica Dewan. She's a globally recognized leadership expert and keynote speaker driving innovation across generations and cultures. She uh, has is the CEO of Cotential. She's spoken worldwide. She's spoken at Davos. She has written the book most recently, Get Big Things Done, The Power of Connectional Intelligence. She wrote it with Saj Nicole Jonai. And Erica is here to speak with us about connectional intelligence and wherever else our conversation goes. Erica, thank you so much for being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. I should also say thank you for being my friend, but thank you for being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Thank you, Peter. It's great to be here. And likewise, thank you for being my friend. (laughs) So let's um, share with the audience, what is connectional intelligence? So a lot of the ways we measure relationships is in the digital world is through quantity, how many Facebook likes we have, how many LinkedIn connections we can have. But in today's hyper-connected and over-connected world, having a lot of networks doesn't necessarily lead to measurable change. The key is the skill of how you leverage your networks of people, ideas, and resources to create valuable change in your community, in your company, and in, in your life. And it's this key skill that we call connectional intelligence, which is the ability to create greater value out of fully maximizing your networks and relationships. What connectional intelligence really does is it shifts our notion from quantity to quality. And it also shifts our notion in our digital hyper-connected world of not just understanding how do we find the answer, but how do we design our questions differently to generate new insights and reach out to networks that we may not be even connected to yet, but could hold hold the key to the next breakthrough solution. So, you know, if you look at, you know, if if I've got 30,000 people following me and, and I'm not necessarily engaging with them in any particular way, you're saying there's no value to that. Like that, that the, you know, it's, it's nice to, you know, it might, massage the ego, but there's no value to having a large network that you're not actually getting anything from or contributing anything particularly to in a, you know, in a symbiotic way. Absolutely. So what we've seen as we've seen the rise of technology and tools to connect is that a lot of the emphasis was on connecting with others, but not focusing at first with what problem are we trying to solve? Who do we want to engage to solve that problem? And I'll give you a quick story. This first story is about a woman named Jeannie Peeper. Jeannie uh, has has suffered from a very rare disease. It's called FOB. She was diagnosed with it when she was four years old. And to give you a sense, in the entire 20th century, there were only two research papers on this disease, so very rare. She went from doctor to doctor trying to better diagnose this illness. And it was only when she was 25 years old she met one specific doctor who had met 18 patients in his lifetime that had this disease. Mm -hmm. And so what Jeannie did is she thought about how could I engage this network of people that had a common situation as me in a meaningful way. So she started writing letters to these patients and created the first ever Facebook group for patients with FOB. Mm -hmm. It began to get completely, um, it was a completely engaged network, not only for patients, but for families and friends that were connected to the patients. Soon enough, it became the first ever knowledge network for patients with FOB and started to better teach doctors and universities how to better diagnose this illness. And this network has now funded medical research for this rare disease and has become a model for rare disease patient communities around the world. So if we think about that story, Jeannie didn't start with how many connections can I create? She started with what problem am I trying to solve? And how could I engage others in a way that is not only has a mutual benefit, but allows us to care and create something even bigger together. And it's from that place that connectional intelligence happens. I love where you're starting with this, Erica, because, you know, it's, it's starting with a mindset, right? It's saying, you know, are you just after a huge number or like, why are you doing this? Why are you spending any time on Facebook or LinkedIn at all? Like why, you know, why are you on there at all? And I, you know, my question that comes along with that is, you know, certainly in the example you've used and a lot of the examples you use in the book, it's almost like there's some combination of 
I'm really devoting the majority of my time to this. Like I, this is a commitment that I'm making because I care so much about it. Here's a woman with an illness that she cares yeah. so much about her. You, you know, you talk about Khan of the Khan Academy. Yes. You talk about um, the, uh, you know, Michelle Phan around the, around the beauty and the YouTube videos that have garnered millions of views. And it seems like there's two things that I kind of want to talk to you about both of them. One is the time commitment, the, the sort of sense that, you know, is this something to do right that you're really spending half your time, you know, on and, and, and or are there, you know, ways of, you know, or, or is my question even wrong? Because, you know, if you don't want to spend a lot of time on it, then why are you doing it anyway? Like you're probably just doing it for some other purpose, in which case it won't work. And then the second question, which, you know, you don't have to answer these at the same time, yeah. is the, um, the fortuitousness of a viral success you know you talk about a lot of viral success and you know was you, you know and we'll we'll talk about your the sort of five c's of connectional intelligence but i want before we do i want to think about or talk about or get your perspective on you know how much of this can be premeditated and how much of it is wow here's a person who hit a chord that that you know went viral but we can't necessarily you know, pre-plan that. So that's, those are my two questions. Great questions, Peter. So let's start with the first one, which is really around, do I need to be, does this need to be my life passion? And uh, do I need to spend a lot of time doing this or can I contribute in a different type of way? And I think you hit on it perfectly that connectional intelligence is a mindset, just like emotional intelligence in the nineties. It's not something that you have to uh, have, you know, 10 hours a day doing in and out to build a community. It could be something that you contribute to in a different way. So let me give you an example. A few years ago at Colgate Palmolive, a big toothpaste company, as we all know, uh, that one team there had a scientific challenge. They had developed a new fluoride that they were meshing in their toothpaste, mm -hmm. but there was a mechanical flow problem and the fluoride was getting stuck in the equipment. It wasn't meshing well. All the best chemists internally were trying to figure out why nobody could. It was taking months and months of time and costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so at that point, one of the executives said, you know, why don't we ask a different network? And it was not something that a scientific company normally did, but what they did is they decided to post this fluoride challenge on a website called Innocentin, which is a crowdsourcing community where scientists come together to help large companies solve scientific challenges. Within two days of posting that challenge, a physicist named Ed Melkrick looked at the problem and he said, this isn't a chemistry problem, this is a physics problem. It's about charged particles. You charge the fluoride one way, toothpaste the other, instantly the problem was solved. So Colgate learned a few things from that experience. The first thing they learned is that they didn't even dare to ask the physicists at their own company because they labeled it as a chemistry problem. And the second thing they realized is that physicists would have never been hired by Colgate. He didn't have the traditional resume. He had had odd jobs throughout his life. And so really the crux of connectional intelligence is a mindset. And it's a mindset around instead of just asking questions like we always have, it's designing our questions in a way where we can be more strategic and broaden who we can access and help generating those insights and solutions. So that's an example different from Jeannie Peeper who had a strong passion and built a community around her passion. That's an example where a team may be able to tap unlocked knowledge inside their organization, maybe a physicist or outside, in a way that could contrib con contribute and lead to speed of execution. Well, and it's also an example where they didn't spend a decade building that network. They went to a network that was already created. They asked a question that was engaging to that particular community that they don't own. And, and then they, uh, you know, and then they got an advantage of it. And, you know, I just, uh, I, I just recently spoke with Joshua Ramos, who wrote The Seventh Sense, who's also talking all about networks and the importance of networks. And, and he's really talking about, in, in many ways, owning those networks, right? He's basically saying when Amazon owns that network, they have a tremendous amount of power when Google owns that network. What you're saying here, which is an interesting voice in that conversation, is... You don't have to own the network. You yeah. you could step into the network and you can, you know, gain a critical advantage by being in the conversation with a bunch of other people. Yes, exactly. And we're not all going to build the next Amazon or Google. Right. The key leadership skill we can build is how do we engage? How do we strategically engage in the right diversity of networks that helps contribute to create that unlocked value? Right. Uh, one of the other stories I love to share is the story of the creation of the 
Doritos guacamole chip at Frito-Lay. And so you think about a product like that, it would have come from product innovation or marketing, but it didn't. It actually came from the Latino Employee Resource Network that when combined at Frito-Lay had primarily come together for employee engagement. But when they were combined, they realized they were asking different questions. And one of them that was obvious to them was, why don't we have a Doritos chip that fully targets the Latino customer segment? They came up with an idea, these ideas. The guacamole chip was a $100 million product. Then the Asian network did the same thing. They created a curry chip that's a bestseller in Asia. And now annually, Frito-Lay brings together these diversity networks, not just for employee engagement, but to actually drive product innovation around unique customer segments. So sometimes it's solving an immediate problem like Colgate. Sometimes it's looking at the networks that we already have that exist and asking what other problems can they solve and how can we engage them in a way at our fingertips without more budget, more legal approvals, more technology to solve problems with us. You know, it's such a great example because, you know, I'm not part of the Latino community. And if you pitch to me a guacamole chip, I would say that's a terrible idea. Like, (laughs) I like dipping my chips in guacamole. I don't want guacamole in my chip or a taste of guacamole. I don't see it. I don't want to buy it. And I'm not the right person to be asking, right? So that's to your point, which is not only be connected with your network, but be connected with a variety of networks that you couldn't possibly own because they're so different from you. Right, because the t- the intelligence that you get, the connection that you get, the the you know the um, critical advantage of some of those relationships, by definition, are yeah. based in the fact that they are not like you, and and that you know, and that would mean that you know it's not all about you know spending your energy and investment to create your own big following community yeah. that you can then connect with. Absolutely, it's it's about partnership and it's about engagement. And right. in our digital hyper connected era, the key is not connecting more; it's connecting intelligently. Right. And that's a big distinction from the Malcolm Gladwell, you know, connector idea just a decade ago. So, so talk to me just about that second question briefly, which is the sort of viral nature of some of what you describe in the book, you know, and how you really spread an idea. And, and the fortuitousness of that versus the predictability of it. Yeah. So what we found by studying leaders and organizations that were able to get big things done and others not was that it was not just the skill of connectional intelligence that existed within teams, but it was preparing and designing for connectional intelligence. So many times we look at virality stories, and yes, there are some specific ones that are just you know, made by the news or made by a TED talk or made by a specific situation. But a lot of them aren't, even though they seem to be. I'll give you one example. So a few years ago at the Super Bowl 2013, there was a blackout at the game. Some of you that watch the Super Bowl, the, you know, the biggest sporting event in the U.S. may remember it. This blackout lasted 46 minutes. And in just four minutes of the blackout, Oreo, the brand, designed, captured, and tweeted out on Twitter an ad that said, power out, no problem, you can still dunk your Oreo in the dark. And it went absolutely viral. It had 20,000 retweets, 15,000 Facebook likes. And the next day it was dubbed the best marketing ad at Super Bowl 2013, beating out every multi-million dollar commercial, including Oreos, made in four minutes and entirely free. So you think about that and you say, how did this happen? This must have been that lucky viral situation, but it actually wasn't. The Oreo team had designed and prepared for that moment for two years. Prior to that game. So you mean they're the ones who shut the lights out in that Super Bowl? Uh, (laughs) No, no. Is this a conspiracy theory? I'm loving it. (laughs) So what they had done is they created a cross-functional SWAT team that was specifically designed. They brought together the legal team, the ad agency, social media executives to practice launching real-time ads around relevant news because they knew to compete in today's era, they needed to be faster and more relevant. And, and, and do it and work in a way that would allow them to do that. So typically an ad, including Oreo's Super Bowl commercial, took six months to create and millions of dollars in an- analysis and research. But from two years before that game, they had also created this cross-functional SWAT team. And this team had started to practice launching real-time ads together every single month. And it was a practice, a collaborative practice that they built. And by building that muscle of trust, it was in that game two years later, 
they were able to create that ad in four minutes that would have traditionally taken six months to create. So we often talk about the viral moments, but it's actually the key question for those that are connectionally intelligent is to ask, how do we design and engage with others in a way to flip our normal ways of working to be more relevant when it really matters? You know, Erica, you're saying something else that I really love, which is, you know, Brilliance comes from creating the foundation of skill and competence that can and 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 the practice is not about rehearsal. It's about it's like it's improv. Like we're not we're not talking, you know, acting class, we're talking improv class. And we're talking the ability to like very strategically hone the skills that allow you in a moment to pivot and apply them on instinct. Yes. And and that's, I think, a really – like that's something we could do a whole podcast on because that's something like is really worth unpacking a little bit, how you, you know, develop the, the, the competence or how you choose the competencies to really, really develop that allow you to sort of pivot in the situation. And, you know, there's some, some research that I've read that I think is very interesting, which is that intelligence is um, uh, judged – by how quickly you respond to a question or how quickly you respond to a situation. So if you take, you know, an extra five seconds to respond to a question, you're deemed, you know, research-wise, you're deemed from people's perspectives less intelligent than someone who answers, you know, immediately. And now this research might be culturally different, meaning it might be different if you did it in Asia versus Latin America versus Africa versus, you know, the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know. Because um, I, I just haven't seen that, but but the idea of an underlying skill saying be and this is what great experts do is and this is what all athletic events are about, which is because all athletic events, you know, you can practice certain things, but there's so many different variables because you've got now another team that you're competing against. So it's about being such a great athlete that you can pivot at any moment and respond to a situation in an effective way. I love that. Absolutely. And, and when, you know, people hear connectional intelligence, they immediately think of the networks and collaboration, but we'll talk about the five C's and one of our first foundational skills underneath connectional intelligence is curiosity. And it's what I call more of a thinking intelligence. And, you know, what, what has happened in the world today is we're inundated with more meme emails, meetings, phone calls. And what, what we often lose from that is the drive in the disruptive spaces for that innovative thinking to generate those breakthrough insights. And so in many ways, part of connectional intelligence is to kill those unneeded bureaucracies mm -hmm. in order to create space for those groundbreaking solutions. Share with us the other four. Sure. So there are five, what we call the five C's of connectional intelligence. The first I mentioned is curiosity and curiosity. The way we define it is not just asking great questions. It's designing your questions so that others can engage with you to help solve those problems. The second is combination. So think of combination as the root of innovation, combining lots of different ideas, people, and resources to come up with new and different results. So think of the Doritos guacamole chip example as a great example of combining employees to solve a problem in an entirely different area. The third is courage. And courage, as we all know, is such a foundational element of all of the examples I shared from Jeannie Peeper stepping out and being courageous when no, no one gave her permission or asked with Colgate reaching out and asking a different network outside, which is not something the company had done before and really be willing to have those different conversations despite traditional or the old ways of always doing things. The fourth is community and community as we have seen in all these stories is it's a foundational part being able to leverage groups of people that that care about common issues. And the fifth C is what I call combustion. So com once you have community, courage, combination, curiosity, the last piece is how do you ignite and mobilize these networks to generate greater value together? So whether it was Jeannie starting the rare disease network that now has led to the first ever medical research being funded around this disease because she created this global network of patients or Colgate being able to identify ways to drive better results by leveraging a crowd of, ex of scientists, experts outside their company, um, or Doritos and beyond. So 
what individuals can do is they can really take, uh, in the book we have a little quiz that you can take to begin to assess yourself on these five C's. But what the real power of that is not only to understand where do you fit among these five C's? Are you high in curiosity? Are you medium in community? But to understand how do you better leverage others that have different strengths than you? And if you have certain strengths in certain areas, how do you design your teams to make sure that you can execute in different ways? Just like the law firm Oreo story where they had the you know more of the combustors, the social media team, but they also had the lawyers with the deep curiosity analyzing every situation. And they also had the community of decision makers, the executives in the room to make sure that got done. So, you know, it's like one of the um, uh, examples that you use. I don't know if I wrote this example in my notes or this if this was the actual language that you use, but you're talking about the connectional intelligence capturing the cognitive surplus of individuals. I'm sure that's your language. And I, I don't know if it was me thinking or you said, but I was thinking about like Uber of the mind, right? It's yeah. like, you know, like, you know, Uber is like this surplus. You, you probably said this and I probably just wrote down your words. But um, why are so, pe so people so willing to offer their surplus mindshare? Why, you know, like, you, how do we tap into it is one question. But also, you know, like, I'm super busy. You su you're super busy. Like, everybody's busy. So are there people just sitting around going, I can't wait to, like, look for the questions I can share my intelligence on and, and like... What's going on that yeah. that people are freely sharing their perspectives, you know, on the internet in with their networks, with their connections? Yeah, why would they even do this, right? <laughs> um, so, what we found in our research is, you know, Malcolm Gladwell ten years ago talked about the idea of the connector, and we took that a step further because what we saw is that we're not we're all connectors today. We're overconnected, and what we found was that. There are three types of connectors that exist as we look at, at different collaboration in organizations and people and companies, et cetera. What we saw is that the three types of connectors are the thinkers, the enablers, and the connection executors. So thinkers are the type of people that love to talk about ideas together. They love to generate what's the big new perspective or how could we ask a different question? These are people with high levels of curiosity, this is the Colgate executive that said, well, why don't we solve this fluoride challenge in a different way, even though we've never done it? The second type are the enablers. These are the people that are more of those traditional super connectors. They understand if they have a problem, they think of who are all the five people we need to surround ourselves with to solve this problem. So you could think about the, um, the Latino network at Frito-Lay saying, you know, we're a group of enablers in solving a different problem that we weren't even asked to do. Mm -hmm. And the third type are the connection executors. These are more of those savvy contributors. This is the physicist that solved the problem at Colgate. That wasn't asked. There was a cash prize. So, you know, what we found is that we've always had thinkers and enablers, but there's this rising breed of what we call the connection executors. And it's people that are willing to contribute and engage outside of monetary desires because they want to learn and they want to be part of a solution. And so what we found is 10 years ago, there weren't that many avenues to be able to contribute outside of our job, our team, our volunteer network, our neighborhood. In our digital age, we've seen a radical shift of that. And, and the best example I can share from the US is um, just in the last month with the hurricanes across the US. There was a woman named Jessica Decker. Jessica is the quintessential connection executor that you're describing. Um, she lives in San Diego. She heard about the hurricane coming, Hurricane Harvey in Houston. She wanted to do something because her friends lived in Houston. She tried to track them down, um, but the phone service was going down and the 911 service stalled in Houston because there were so many calls. So what everyone did in Houston that had and used Twitter is they started to share messages on Twitter of where help was needed most. Yeah, and cool. Jessica is a data scientist. So she created an open map that mined these Twitter messages. She found a team of people around the world that wanted to help her. They created, they created a 24 hour on-call team and they were using this map to visually show where help was needed most through Twitter messages. The US Coast Guard and Marine Corps used this map and they, used, they collected over 28,000 messages 
and noted that they identified over 5,500 people so, that were through this. So you answered the, this is also the answer to the previous question that I asked about, you know, why are people so willing yeah. to, to do this? And I think it's, it's really compelling, which is you find something that you really, really care about that's important to you. And then you find the network of other people who also really, really care about this. And there's a tremendous generosity when you're in a group of people and you all care about the same thing and you want to help. You know, it's not about I'm, it's not even about I'm helping you. It's about together we're helping this other thing. Yes. And, and that, that creates a tremendous amount of energy and people are willing to, to commit any of their surplus, you know, mind share to, you know, the sort of cognitive surplus of individuals uh, could be channeled in that direction. Yeah. And our greatest sources of help are often where we least expect them. So instead of asking who traditionally cares about this problem, it's asking who else cares or who could care, right? right? right. Um, and that's where we get those really surprising, unique results, again, in a digital, globally connected world. Final that's question. If you were to give me advice about how I can become more connectionally intelligent, what would you tell me? Number one, I, I would share the 10 minute rule and it's to spend 10 minutes a day improving your curiosity. And the way that you could do that is to think about what's one resource or perspective that you would like to bring into your life that could help ask you, help you find questions. So it could be following three Twitter hashtags on something that you care about. It could be going on Quora and answering questions or, or sharing knowledge. It could be if you're a scientist, it could be going on in Ocentive. But think about how you could spend 10 minutes a day connecting more to something specific and unique that you care about. The second thing that you can do is on my website, we have a quiz that you can take that will help assess you on the five C's of connectional intelligence. And out of that report, you will better understand what connection style are you? Are you a thinker, enabler, or executor? And from that, what you can do is not only begin to think about how well are you leveraging your strengths around collaboration, but who else do you need to partner with to better become more connectionally intelligent? So if you're a thinker, you like to talk to a lot of people, maybe you need to find those connection executors so you can create the Oreo moment of your, of your team. Right. If you're the um, enabler, maybe you, you, know, you need to think like the guacamole chip example. That's great. And Erica, how do people get to your website? What's your website? So my main website is ericaduan.com, and it's where you can get some of these tools uh, around the assessment and uh, learn more about how to use this. And you can also find me at potentialgroup.com, which is our corporate website for training and keynotes. Great. And we'll have both of those in the show notes. Um, Erica, the book is Get Big Things Done, The Power of Connectional Intelligence. It's on the screen if you're watching the video. Um, Erica Dewan, thank you so much both for writing the book, for your interesting and useful perspectives. For me, even having read the book, this conversation shed light on certain elements of it that I really appreciated and, and, and actually has gotten my mind really thinking about how I should shift things. I, I'm one of the people who... Like I spend some time on social media, but really as little as possible. And, yeah. and I actually, you've, you've convinced me not because, oh, it's the smart thing to do, but because I can now see a path to do it in a way that I actually feel like I'll be very engaged in, which makes all the difference because I don't want to do it just because it's strategic. Yeah. And I know that I won't be able to keep that up. But, but the idea of, of really kind of connecting on the thing I care most about is very compelling. So thank you. Thank you for your, the, the sort of wealth of wisdom that you've shared with us. And thank you for being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Thank you so much, Peter. It was great to be on.